let's talk about what we're going to do now. What, what have we done so far? Well, the nitrogen has attacked the carbonyl carbon once. But notice that after the nitrogen attacks, it ends up with a positive charge, which it doesn't like. But that's OK. It can get rid of the positive charge by losing its proton. Now, this nitrogen still has a lone pair. Mm -hmm. So in a way, the nitrogen would like to attack this, this carbon here again. Mm -hmm. uh, however, the nitrogen can't attack this carbon because if it did, it would have a positive charge again, and it doesn't have any more protons okay. to lose. That's the difference between why primary amines give you a category 3 reaction and secondary amines give you a category 4 reaction. A primary amine has at least two protons on it, so the nitrogen can attack twice. And then we would end up with something that looks like this. That's the reaction we've worked on a lot more. But in order for the nitrogen to attack twice, it would have had to start with two protons. The secondary amine only started with one proton, so it's only going to be able to attack this one time. So who are we going to get to do the second attack on the carbonyl? Well, you already worked that out. There's no preference in this particular molecule right. because they're symmetrical. That's right. Yeah. No preference because these are equivalent to each other. It turns out, you really just have to have this memorized or look it up in the handout, that we're going to get the electrons to attack the carbonyl carbon now from this bond over here. Okay. That means that somebody has to take this proton, and you, you decide, well, maybe the water could take it. If I told you who the acid was here, you could use the, its conjugate base to take the proton, too. For example, if this came from sulfuric acid, you could use the hydrogen sulfate to take this, but the water is fine. you remember that? That was going to be my next question. Why is it called an enamine? What does the EN stand for? For the double bond on the... Uh, right. Why does it stand for a double bond? Because of the word alkene. It's short for alkene and obviously amine. So this should be a very logical name. It's not very difficult to remember. Remember that if this had been a primary nitrogen, we would have ended up with an imine. That was the category 3 reaction that we've seen a lot more examples of. A primary nitrogen, amine would end up with an imine like this. We haven't talked as much about the idea that a secondary amine ends up with an enamine. Okay. The nitrogen can only attack once, so the second attack has to come from the side here, so to speak, from this alpha carbon. That really just has to be memorized. So going back to the handout again, you can always review this in the handout in the left-hand column. The one step that gave you trouble was the proton transfer here. Uh, basically, you were trying to do this step too soon. That's you were trying to do this step before there was room for it because the water had left. But then after the proton transfer, the, uh, the alpha carbon loses a proton, forming the pi bond to the carbonyl carbon, just like you figured out. And the product is an unit, just like we talked about. Uh, and as it says here on the handout, we just went through the mechanism for acid catalysts. Uh, you probably wouldn't be expected to do the mechanism for base catalyst, even though this could work with a base catalyst. So we produced an enamine. Overall, then, what this tells us is that an aldehyde or a ketone plus a secondary amine gives us an enamine. And it should be logical that, this, um, that we can't make an imine here because this nitrogen can only attack once because it only has one possible deprotonation. I think, again, it's a really good idea to keep asterisking the carbonyl carbon, former carbonyl carbon, and former carbonyl oxygen. We talked about the idea of hidden carbonyls. Um, that was in some of the videos, anyway. We did, we did. Okay. Now, a hidden carbonyl is simply a carbon that can be easily made back into a carbonyl. One thing I should have actually put in here is that all these steps are reversible. So not only could you use this, you could use this ketone as the starting material and make this enamine, but you can also start with an enamine and make it into a ketone. Although actually, now that I think about it, that's not going to be important for this chapter. So that was a red herring. We won't need to go over that. So. Okay. I think that was, was that last chapter. Yeah. So we'll, we'll be talking about a different type of hidden carbonyl in a second. So I jumped the gun a little bit. All we need to know now is how to make these enamines. All right. We just went through the mechanism here. It's very important to know this mechanism, but you should also be able to do this without doing the whole mechanism. So how can you do this without the whole mechanism? Well, first of all, you just have to recognize that because this is a secondary amine, we're going to get a category four. 
and you need to say to yourself, that means the carbonyl oxygen will be completely blasted off. That it still helps to asterisk the former carbonyl carbon. And who's going to be now? Who's going to replace these two bonds? Well, one of the bonds will be replaced by the nitrogen, okay. and the other bond will be a new pi bond to the alpha carbon. That's what it takes to get to the product without going through this whole mechanism, which is important as well. Notice that we didn't break any of these other bonds in this nucleophile. Those are still the same over here. So it should, we should also be able to do this without going through the whole mechanism. This is going to be pretty much the same exact pattern. Okay. Now what we need to do here is predict the product. Right. And now it's your choice. If you want to, you can go through the whole mechanism just like we did. Okay. Or if you want to, you can just try to go straight to the product, whichever you're comfortable with. But this should be following the same exact pattern that we did before. Looks like you decided to skip the mechanism, and that worked out fine because you got the you still got the exact right product. So that's good. So how can we do this? Well, I'll start by you can use the redraw and modify technique. Incidentally, so what you did here is you drew a category four attack. Mm -hmm. How do we know this is going to be a category four attack? Because we have a second. Right. Secondary amine. So it can't form an imine because it can only attack once. By the way, we were assuming here that it was the nitrogen and not the oxygen that would be the nucleophile. One way to see that is, remember, the only way that you can be an effective nucleophile is if you can then deprotonate to get rid of your positive charge. This can be a nucleophile once because it can then deprotonate to get rid of its positive charge. This can't be a very effective nucleophile because after it attacked, it would have a positive charge and it would have no protons to get rid of. So we don't need to worry about nucleophilic attack from the oxygen, just from the nitrogen. So this was just a, a red herring to distract us. This is the atom that's going to be the nucleophile. And when, when uh, uh, atoms other than uh, uh, carbons, if they have uh, hydrogens, they're indicated, right? They're never assumed that they're hidden. Is that correct? That's a good point. That's a good point. We know that it's optional whether we show the hydrogens on carbon in bottom line notation. It's legal to show them, but it's also legal to leave them out. But you made a good point. You don't have any choice. You must show hydrogens on the hetero atoms. You must show the hydrogens on any non-carbons. So yeah, we can trust that there's no hydrogens over here. We also knew that because it's neutral and it's already got two bonds. But yeah, they'd have to show us hydrogens. Only carbons can have hidden hydrogens. Only carbons can have hidden hydrogens. That's a good point. So this is just to distract us. This is still the nucleophile. We're going to do a category four attack, and we decided to skip the mechanism this time. Well, we know from memorization that in category four, there's going to be two attacks on the carbonyl carbon, which means that both bonds to the carbonyl oxygen have to get blasted off. So we can eliminate that carbonyl oxygen. And under acidic conditions, it's eventually going to end up as part of an H3O plus, perhaps, or at least a water. Now, who's going to attack this carbonyl carbon? Well, one thing that's going to attack it is this nitrogen. There's no reason to change any of these bonds in the nucleophile. But we know that after the nitrogen attacked, it's going to have to deprotonate to lose its positive charge. So we've taken off that hydrogen. A neutral nitrogen is only supposed to have three bonds. But we still need to replace the second bond to the oxygen here. Well, you remembered how to do that. 
that's replaced by a mu pi bond to this alpha part. And again, these two are equivalent, so you could have drawn it on either side okay. in this case. And what's the general name for this type of functional group? Okay. Enemy. Yeah. So you made an enemy here, just like before. This category four attack always makes an enemy. Okay. They really, uh, as far as I know, there's only one mechanism that falls into category four, which is production of enamines from a secondary amine attacking an aldehyde or a ketone. This is the only category four we'll have to go through. 